hi to all of you from Fluffy here, Chocolate Downstairs playing, and a huge hug to all of you and the all of your wonderful, wonderful furry souls that we all have around the world. And that we have some good news. We broke through 222,000 subscribers this week. So thank you, thank you to everyone out there. If you haven't subscribed, it doesn't cost you anything, but it helps Earth Files at YouTube. So I appreciate your clicking on the red button in the lower right of your screen if you haven't subscribed. And in spite of worries that it still might be delayed early this morning at 1.47 a.m. Eastern Time, the huge 322-foot tall space launch system known as the Artemis One moon rocket finally launched. NASA's new moon rocket lifted off from Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida for its first unmanned test flight to the moon. And here we go. Ten. Hydrogen burnoff igniters initiated. Seven, six, five, four stage engine start. Three, two, one. Boosters in ignition. And liftoff of Artemis One. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. on the core stage and two solid rocket boosters now propelling the vehicle at 128 miles per hour. About two hours after launch, the upper stage of Artemis fired up to give Orion a really big push toward the moon. Artemis will stay in orbit for between 6 and 19 days, and you can keep up with our Artemis news on this free NASA website on your screen. As NASA is moving outward again to the moon and working on plans for a manned mission to Mars, plasma physicist John E. Brandenburg, PhD, spoke recently about more evidence of ancient thermonuclear explosions on Mars at the recent 25th annual Mars Society International Convention that was held October 20th to the 23rd at the University of Arizona in Tempe. Dr. Brandenburg is famous for his 2015 book entitled Death on Mars, The Discovery of a Planetary Nuclear Massacre. The book evolved from Dr. Brandenburg's research from 1984 to 2015 about high levels of xenon-129 and other radioactive isotopes on Mars that he concluded were produced by at least one, probably two, hydrogen bomb equivalent e explosions. His latest research places the timeline near 180 million years ago above the, the Cydonia region in the northern hemisphere of Mars. In fact, the data convinced Dr. Brandenburg that at least two hydrogen bombs did explode above the Cydonia region of Mars. But who, why, and exactly when? Those questions are especially haunting, since Mars has had two lives, one as a watery planet and then as a red desert. This illustration by NASA is based on scientific evidence that 3.7 billion years ago, Mars had more water shown here in blue than the Arctic Ocean on Earth does today. So what changed Mars so dramatically? Some data suggests a large asteroid might have hit Mars hard and caused its large oceans to eventually dry up into red dust. But that does not explain what happened on Mars 180 million years ago? What caused thermonuclear radiation on Mars in which some xenon-129 levels were two and a half times higher than Earth's after three atomic bombs at the end of World War II? I asked Dr. Brandenburg, now working as a consultant at Kepler Aerospace LLC in Midland, Texas, 
to update newer information about nitrogen-15 and argon-40 appearing on Mars with xenon-129 at the same time estimated to be 180 million years ago in rock samples. Dr. Brandenburg titled his latest Mars Society paper, quote, evidence of large R process events on Mars in the past, close quote. R process events combine nuclear fusion and fission processes and feature intense high energy neutron bombardment of he heavy elements. Physicists know only two types of R process events. One, when a star blows up in a supernova, or the second, a thermonuclear explosion like the atomic bombs of 1945 and later hydrogen bomb tests. Dr. Brandenburg says that the nuclear isotopes in the Martian atmosphere are similar to hydrogen bomb tests on Earth. This is the Castle Bravo hydrogen bomb test conducted at Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands on March 1, 1954. The explosion yielded 15 megatons, more than two and a half times what scientists had expected, making it the largest bomb ever exploded by the United States. Dr. Brandenburg hypothesizes that there were two atmospheric nuclear explosions upwind from two places in the Martian Northern Hemispheres, Cydonia Mensa and Galaxius Chaos, where excess xenon-129 is found and krypton-80 is also found in some rocks. In both of those Martian sites, trinitite that looks like green glass has been found at both locations. Trinitite is associated with the melting of sand at nuclear bomb sites. For example, green crystal trinitite like this was found at ground zero after the New Mexico White Sands 1945 atomic bomb test. Trinitite forms after sand is scooped up into the atomic fireball, liquefies in the intense heat, and then falls back onto the hot sand where it forms into green, glassy chunks of melted sand. Dr. Brandenburg says trinitite glass has been found from an orbiter above the Martian Cydonia region. And back in 1979 in Antarctica on Earth, this meteorite was found that appears to have come from Mars where two different lava flows crossed over each other, leaving a rock sandwich that was labeled by scientists EETA79001. The left side of 79001 showed little neutron irradiation, but the right side, which was cut up in smaller pieces to investigate, had been exposed to intense neutron bombardment that included trapped gas bubbles of xenon-129, argon-40, and krypton-80. Analyzing both sides of the rock, Dr. Brandenburg concluded that the strong neutron irradiation event on the right side of the meteorite occurred around 180 million years ago on Mars. This Mars versus Earth Xenon 129 graph shows the high Mars red spike measurement of Xenon 129 compared to Earth's lower blue spike of Xenon 129 after America's atomic bomb test and two atomic bomb detonations in Japan that ended World War II. And yet, the Mars red Xenon 129 peak is two and a half times greater than the Earth blue Xenon 129 peak after World War II, and decades of testing and producing plutonium with fast neutrons. In addition to strong neutron radiation in two places on the Cydonia landscape, there is this large five-sided pyramid that is one kilometer high, or 3,280 feet high, 
and three kilometers long, which is 9,842 feet at its base. Then, about 15 kilometers, or seven miles, from the Big Pyramid is the famous city on the left and the face on Mars up in the upper right corner. Here is an enlarged photo that scientist Mark Carlotto from the Analytical Sciences Corporation north of Boston produced from the original Viking data. The face is one kilometer wide, 3,280 feet, and from chin to helmet, it's one and a half kilometers long, 4,921 feet, and from ground to the top of the nose, it's one half kilometer high, or 1,640 feet high. Other evidences beyond the Xenon 129 spike in the Martian atmosphere include the discovery of a Krypton 80 abundance in young Mars meteorites that show an intense neutron flux in the Northern Hemisphere. There's also a high abundance of Argon 40 that must be the result of neutron capture during an R process event that took place on Mars about 180 million years ago that Dr. Brandenburg asks, why did Mars die? The evidence is now quite compelling. Mars suffered a nuclear holocaust. The cause of this was unknown, but apparently two explosions of massive energy. We're talking billions of megatons and they detonated kilometers above the surface, so they didn't cause craters. At Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there are no craters. There never were, because they detonated the weapons at midair to maximize the shock waves striking the ground. So the two really new important things that we have found is, even though I couldn't find in published data in the open literature, the results of sampling air after a hydrogen bomb test that would show the Xenon-129 spike. I couldn't find that. That's never been declassified. But I have shown this to several nuclear weapons experts since that time, and they have agreed it looks like enormous hydrogen bombs went off on Mars based on the isotopic evidence. But what I have found now is simulations of supernova, it's called R process, meaning rapid bombardment of high energy neutrons of heavy elements like thorium and uranium and things like that that occurs in a hydrogen bomb, but it also occurs in the core of a supernova. What I've found is in the literature, simulations of supernova show clearly the xenon 129 spike that we see on Mars. So I now have scientific literature to back up my assertion that there were enormous R process events on Mars in the past based on the Xenon 129. And also there's more evidence that Mars surface and atmosphere were bombarded heavily by neutrons. The second new piece of data involves the nitrogen and argon in the Martian atmosphere. The most abundant gas in Mars atmosphere is carbon dioxide. The second most abundant is nitrogen. It's about 2.5%. And then argon is another gas that's also present in the Earth's atmosphere, but on Mars it's almost the same. It's about 2% of the atmosphere. But argon is what's called a noble gas or inert gas. Now, one of the isotopes of argon is argon-40, and in Mars atmosphere... It is super abundant compared to Earth. What happened is apparently Mars' surface was heavily bombarded with neutrons when this same process occurred that created all the xenon-129, as you would expect if there was a nuclear explosion. This is new data that you've presented that now you have evidence that the argon-40 and the xenon-129 arrived at the same time on Mars. Yes, at the same time, the argon-40, and there's a stable isotope of nitrogen that's formed when you set off a nuclear weapon in the atmosphere like Earth. 
the neutrons that come out combine with the nitrogen in the air, and they release very deadly gamma rays. When a nuclear weapon goes off over a city, not only does the neutrons from the gamma rays from the original explosion kill people, but the very air around them absorbs the neutrons from the bomb and then radiates gamma rays because of the nitrogen-14 absorbing a neutron and then turning into nitrogen-15 and emitting a gamma ray in the process. Gamma rays very deadly so that the very air around human beings becomes a source of radiation due to the neutrons in the nitrogen. So that apparently also happened on Mars because there's much more nitrogen-15 in proportion to nitrogen-14 on Mars than there is in the Earth's atmosphere. We also have new evidence from the dominant gases in the Martian atmosphere. Two of the dominant gases are nitrogen and argon. The distributions of isotopes in them show that they were produced by a massive bombardment of neutrons by the Martian surface and the Martian atmosphere itself. This is very new data. As I understand, it was that they emerged in Mars at exactly the same time, 180 million years ago. Right. The dating of the massive explosions is apparently 180 million years ago. We know that because there is a Mars meteorite called EETA 79001 that shows it's a lava sandwich. It's two lava flows that actually occurred at almost the same time. One of them shows very high bombardment by neutrons. The other part of it shows much less. What it means is the neutrons were very active when one lava flow was still moving and the other one was frozen, hardened, and there was less neutrons when it hardened. So this puts an approximate date of the event at 180 million years ago. When I discovered this possibility and the data that supported it, I did not report it to NASA. I reported it to the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Pentagon CIA, basically. And they sent over somebody to listen to my presentation. He took very careful notes, and he looked very serious. He asked a lot of very good questions, and then he said, we'll get back to you. I waited for about six weeks, and then they sent back a message through channels that said, publish. So they wanted this to come out. And the they would have been? People from the Pentagon. Who have you talked to in intelligence about the implications of What kind of war between which extraterrestrials would have been fought in this solar system over Mars and possibly Earth? People I used to work with when I had a very high security clearance, uh, working with the various intelligence agencies. I was working on scientific intelligence called MAZINT. So I was working there in 2001 1999 to 2001, till shortly after 9-11. And it had become clear what the likely scenario was. It appears that there was a culture on Mars that was humanoid. It looks like early Kingdom Egypt or the Mayans. Mm -hmm. And then the scenario which seems to fit what we have found best is that some other alien group came and decided to destroy this culture on Mars and the entire Mars biosphere with it so it could never recover. There were a lot of pictures taken by Viking of Cydonia which were never released to the public. Because it looks exactly like a face. Yes, and the pyramid looks exactly like a pyramid. Right. So you get a pyramid and a face right next to each other. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what that implies. Right, and the connection between a humanoid face and a large pyramid on Mars, knowing that we have in our Mesopotamian region of the Earth large yes. pyramids and sphinxes, then who would have been warring on Earth and on Mars 
that would have ended up with two hydrogen bombs exploding over Cydonia, where the big pyramid and the face on Mars were. It implies that this bombing was to try to destroy whoever built those. Yes, that is what I think is the most likely scenario based on the evidences I have found. And since the invaluable work of Zechariah Sitchin in the 20th century, ranging from the 12th planet to the lost book of Enki, he helped all of us who wanted to know who the Anunnaki were and why they allegedly fought each other so violently that even nuclear weapons were used. And now more books have emerged in this 21st century with translations of Anunnaki stone tablets about evil winds of radioactivity and bodies falling dead to the streets in the Middle Eastern region that is today's Iraq. One of the books from 2016 that I have found so valuable is this one, Wars of the Anunnaki, Nuclear Self-Destruction in Ancient Sumer by Chris H. Hardy, Ph.D. And in this, there is a um, opening subtitle, and the quote is, the abominable war of the Enlilites, meaning Enlil versus Enki, and there were those behind Enlil, against Marduk, and that they were using nuclear weapons. It contains pages of lamentations about the radioactive contaminated cities where so many people died. And there are a few brief translations that I thought I would share and that you would think as you hear this, not just Earth in Iraq, but Mars, because the Anunnaki talked about Mars. Quote, the storm in a flash of lightning created a dense cloud that brings gloom and then rushing wind gusts, a tempest that furiously scorches the heavens. The storm crushed the land, wiped out everything. None could escape it. Causing cities to be desolated, houses to become desolate, that Sumer's oxen no longer stand in their stalls, the sheep no longer roam in the sheepfolds, that its rivers flow with water that is bitter, that its cultivated fields grow weeds, that its steps grow withering plants. This evil which has assaulted the land like a ghost, the highest walls, the thickest walls, it passes as a flood. No door can shut it out, no bolt can turn it back. The people, terrified, could hardly breathe. The evil wind clutched them does not grant them another day. Mouths were drenched in blood. Heads wallowed in blood. The face was made pale by the evil wind. So those are a few translations from the Anunnaki stone tablets about the use of nuclear weapons by the Anunnaki so long ago. And I wonder if we knew the whole truth that we will find Anunnaki archaeology on Mars as well. And I hope that in sharing this much with you tonight, in the context of every 24 hours of my wondering, are we going to have news about a nuke on Earth now? and look at what we have just been through with wondering what's going to happen about the missile that came down or the weapon came down on the Polish border. And hopefully that is resolving itself. But we are in an age where reading about the Anunnaki and all of their violence, and then realizing that there are scientists like Dr. John Brandenburg who have been studying and comparing what was in the air on the Earth after the bombs were dropped in World War II versus what they were seeing 
from Viking 76 onward, when they have been able to measure what is in the radioactive, uh, uh, radioactive elements in the air on Mars. And to realize that there are comparisons and the idea that the Anunnaki may have been on two planets simultaneously or went from one to another to another and that we are getting ready for the first time in this decade for people publicly at least to go to Mars. I think our government has had all kinds of uh, scientists and people involved with investigating. But if we're going to open up finally the truth that we're not alone in this universe, I really feel it is important that we look with straight, clear eyes at what we know and what others are trying to tell us about this universe, what's in it, what they do, why they do it, and what kind of archaeology will we find on Mars and perhaps even still alive bases of others. So on that note, on this night in November, I'm going to turn it over to Ian. Hi, Linda. Yeah. Okay, Linda. Uh, we've got some uh, comments coming in already. I've got a comment here from Lee Grass in Arizona. She says she's happy to share her story of her experiences of living on Mars during an invasion of spacecraft that obliterated the red planet, initiating, uh, initiating an evacuation. It's a past life that I recently found out about. I both lived the experiences of it and witnessed the, the experience while being pure awareness. My intuition tells me I lived during the time of the hydrogen explosion on Mars. I feel sure I was a witness to it. When I think of it, it's like looking back through a corridor of time so long ago. I can't relate to it, but I know I'm connected to it. Um, I really uh, do personally uh, respect that when people do have what they think are memory downloads that can come through meditation or through hypnosis or uh, spontaneous, that uh, these are... They, these are coming for reasons that we may not know. And so I thank you for sending that tonight uh, because what did happen on Mars that so long ago was a watery planet? And as Dr. Brandenburg asked, how did Mars die? So thank you. Go ahead, Ian. We've got further corroboration of that from Blue Sky. Linda, thank you and your team for the hard work to find the truth. Maybe you guys can find out why I had 50 years ago those dreams from a mushroom cloud behind me and leaving home to go somewhere else with a spaceship. Those dreams I had until I was close to 20 years old. I can't wait. Can you sketch what you were seeing in terms of the very particular craft that you entered and were you always in the craft or were you taken to an environment that you think, looking back, might have been another planet? Uh, those are sort of standard questions that I would want with, uh, with almost any report like that. Right, and they can send any sketches right. or pictures that they've got that they can produce to earthfiles at earthfiles.com. We'd be pleased to look at them. Right. Yeah, and... Other people are commenting on this as well. Brenda Streiner says, uh, she says that uh, it's absolutely a ravaged planet. It looks like a ravaged planet. But I think what we don't know about is all of the underground. There is so much of history on the earth, in the moon, on the ground, Ganymede and beyond, where there are huge underground facilities. And that is something that I think is another step uh, that eventually humanity will be introduced to that. But right now we keep thinking of surface because we live on the surface of the earth. I think it's becoming clearer to me that uh, so many of the intelligences that 
people in the abduction syndrome interact with, that where they live naturally, they live inside of, underground of, below basins of where, they're, where they are on their planets. Pamela Jean says uh, in a paranormal glimpse that she had a tall being and her were on Mars. He showed me a canal filled with flowing water. She also talks about hydraulics and seeing vehicles on a rail. I wonder if anybody has had any dreams or an abduction in which they feel like that they are on Mars and they are actually seeing the Anunnaki, the Anunnaki type, the big nose, the ropey headdress. Um, it would be very interesting if any of you uh, have had some sort of, let's say, a download as if it was coming from a time when Mars was occupied by the Anunnaki that, to me, they look like the Archaloids that are described to Ronald Reagan in the March of 1981 uh, briefing about ETs at Camp David. And I've shared that with you several times before. But on that list of the Ebens and the Archaloids and the Quadloids and the Heploloids and the Tronoloids, uh, that the Archaloid is the one that has been described to me as being in the Holloman Air Force Base landing. That I uh, have the uh, illustration that was d drawn from a 16 millimeter frame and it's in my An Alien Harvest and Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1. And the being has such a Sumerian, or uh, maybe Anunnaki or both, look with a kind of uh, ropey headdress around a high head, um, the, holding the rod that you see in the carved stone, especially Shamash, the sun god of Samaria, and what is exactly the blood relationship between the Sumerians and the Anunnaki, um, and why Enlil was so warring and violent is a puzzle. So thank you. Uh, th there's much to explore, not only about our current lives, but if the soul recycles, then reincarnation eventually, let's hope, would be something more like, I remember that life on Mars. Go ahead. Yes, Linda, Christina Ledesma Jimenez says, is there still life on Mars, possibly underground there now in the present day? Yes, I think so. I really, really do. I wouldn't be surprised at all if we were shown the inside of Mars, that there are all kinds of installations and that there might even be uh, some of the, whatever you want to call them, uh, evolutionary progenitors, or as uh, Dr. Brandenburg said, that they had information in the discussions that he had with people who were in the know, that there were beings on Mars that were um, compared to uh, e ancient Egyptian. And it, what exactly that means is not clear to him or to me. Lindo, Leonardo says, we may, so Leon Luciano says, I agree, we may be Martians that escaped from Mars. <laughs> yeah, I know when we start getting to who our our who are our true progenitors, meaning that which preceded and was involved with the genetic manipulation, which is exactly what Enlil, Enki, Marduk, and that world of Anunnaki and Sumerians. Their own stone tablets are about their making us, making a life form that could do the work, the grimy work on earth. And that there, then there was something apparently about the, we'll call it, we, it would not have been 
necessarily Homo sapiens sapien as we are uh, right now, but one of the genetic manipulations in already evolving primates. And that was done under the control of Enlil and On in order, or Anu, in order to have a workforce of slave labor on earth. That was the original intent in the Anunnaki stone tablets for their genetic manipulation. Anki and Enlil were brothers, and Enki took a liking to the genetically manipulated being that they were creating that eventually Enlil wanted to completely eliminate, and ergo, another reason for wars. But if this is true, if that were true, then we are a genetic lineage that may have may have been uh, the target of somebody like Enlil wanting to completely, completely erase what he considered to be a huge mistake, but something else, and it's the something else that always comes up. Is it the tall whites, the Nordics? What is the relationship between those particular extraterrestrial civilizations, those that are behind the Anunnaki and the Sumerian, and on and on and on, as we have talked in previous programs, that uh, people who I think are reliable in terms of their knowledge that they've been exposed to in aerospace and physics and medicine and uh, military, that there really are a lot of different civilizations and with different intents. And that's where the friendly, neutral, and hostile comes from. And the more that we can learn, the stronger we will be, is my point of view. So I hope that this has been a valuable piece tonight, uh, even though we all don't uh, speak the Iraqi language uh, that the Anunnaki uh, left in thousands and thousands and thousands of stone tablets. That's where the richness of the translations that Zechariah Sitchin and Chris Hardy and others who are working in this, uh, these stone tablets have, have been a archaeological legacy. But they don't give us answers about what exactly is our relationship to their enemies, to their friendlies, to their neutrals. We don't have a clear understanding standing of exactly what all these relationships are and how vulnerable could Earth be if we did not have what appears to be the vested interests of the tall whites and the Nordics. So it's as if all of, all of this whole issue about what's on Mars in relationship to Anunnaki in the past is being asked in the present, but we don't have anybody filling in even identifiers because we still have not been told the truth that we're not alone in this universe. It's a strange way to evolve. Go ahead, Ian. You mentioned earlier just now about the Trantaloids. Mr. M.H. says a question for Linda. Due to humankind being threatened by the Trantaloids, is it a far-fetched assumption that humans may be forced into an alliance of convenience with the reptilians as a result? I understand the geopolitical nature of the question. And I think that my answer is the title of uh, conference papers I have presented called A Hall of Mirrors with a Quicksand Floor. For a long time, I have felt that all of the content associated with the evolution of Earth into a variety of different 
humanoids was related to unknown, completely unknown agendas by other intelligences. And that the bell-shaped curve of those agendas has never been taught to us, the Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien. And therefore, it is extremely hard to even guess at whether or not alliances with the tall whites and the Nordics would be something that they would want to keep because we serve some purpose for them. And therefore, if they are as strong as they, I've been told that they are or can be, as long as their vested interest in what happens to Homo sapiens sapiens serves their Nordic and tall white agendas, I, at least I have the impression that the reptilians would not be able to move against them. And when you start trying to analyze the complexities of multiple level chess games, which is what we're talking about, and beings that go back in time so much further than we, we do. I personally feel that the one thing that needs to happen more than anything else is that we need the whole truth to be told to the whole world of humans and let everybody begin to judge for themselves. And I know military people and the government people say, we can't do it, we can't do it, it would, there would be too much uh, psychological breakdown and conflict and uh, t stock markets will fall and religions will crumble and all of those reasons that are given for not telling the truth continue on this planet Earth, they continue for us humans a classified reality. And that is crazy. So on the sheer bottom line that we are never going to be an evolving species into the light and the strength of the light, if we can't get past this irrational period on earth where reality is classified now and it has been classified for centuries. This is crazy. If we could know all of it, what is the whole huge big enchilada, good, bad, and indifferent? One of the best results might be that we would begin to understand why there are pages, like in the Nag Hammadi, about the thought that dwells in the light. What David Bohm and Roger Penrose have talked about in terms of implicate orders and the wholeness that this one universe is in, and that we humans, we deserve we deserve as a consciousness with a soul. We deserve to know the whole big picture truth. So that's how, <clears throat> that's my personal perspective on any questions about political agenda, uh, I guess you would say political games making, uh, making deals, we deserve to know the whole truth, and then we can make up decisions for ourselves. Okay, Ian. Okay, Linda, let's do the super chats this evening in reverse order. Thank you very much, everybody, for your kind contributions. It really does help. Here we go. Judy Graham, Susie Fairfield, Jason Odu, Liz Gaspari, Christina Ledesma Jimenez, Steve Nadamski, Caroline Boyce, 3OG, Terry D, Transgressive Chemist, Nathaniel Moskin, Sarah Underwood, and Moonbird. 
And Caroline Boyce says, thank you, Linda, Ian and team. Why is Dr. Brandenburg's information not widely known? NASA should be broadcasting this to the world. Yes, and it is part of the classifying of reality. Uh, John has been trying to understand this truth, this story, since he was working on his uh, first uh, MS and then a PhD in plasma physics. And he was, I believe it was UC Davis at this particular point. I've told this story before, but it's worth uh, coming back around because it is the seed that has burned in John Brandenburg for decades, just like each of us for one reason or another that seem to be trying so hard in their lives to understand what the truth is. Um, Dr. Brandenburg, not uh, a full PhD then, was at a, the library, and the library was a classified library. You had to have uh, a privileged right to get into this library in this particular wing uh, at the university. So the people who were in there were in there with serious work to do, and John was holding what he wanted to have printed, and behind him was a man, and John was looking at, he had gotten uh, the Viking 76 when we went around Mars, Viking 1976. He had gotten some information about a Xenon, 129 measurement and some other things and he had it in his notebook and this is what he wanted to print. So what he is holding is what he wants to print and he just turned to the man that he knew behind him was one of the uh, advanced professors and he showed this professor this information that he had from Mars Viking and the professor said, quote unquote, well, they nuked them. Those were the words. Well, they nuked them, meaning that John was showing levels that had been measured in Viking uh, in 1976, and he had also other information having to do with radioactive isotopes, and that the professor behind him knew enough about what John was showing him that this was his reaction. Well, they nuked them. That was where it started for John Brandenburg, and he never let go. He wanted to find out what in the world could those words be true. And now in 2022, soon to be 2023, the whole question of radioactive isotopes that have certain combination signatures that relate to atomic bombs, hydrogen bombs, and so forth, are well studied and well known, way beyond when John was uh, a PhD student standing in line at a printing office. And it will be fascinating to learn if in April we are finally told the truth that at least one more planet has a biological signature beyond Earth. Of course, many do, but this is the way that it's been described, that they, the powers that be, they want to open it up in a nice, safe, distance, controlled way. While there is all of the discussion that it is this decade that the powers that be want someone to go to Mars publicly and publicly announce at the uh, establishment of some kind of a base, even though I understand that there are already underground bases that are being used and have been being used on Mars since at least 1972, but that they're going to go through the theater of us getting to Mars, and then will there finally be an honest effort to show the archaeology, to talk honestly about the civilizations that have been in this solar system over the many years 
going way back before Homo sapiens sapien even existed. That's the truth. And for us to continue to be denied about that, it, it doesn't make any sense. And it makes the hall of mirrors with a quicksand floor even more puzzling. Why does something, someone want to keep Homo sapiens sapien in the dark for so long? It's a really, really good question. And if any of you listening tonight who may have had abductions or been in the military or science who have any insights about why we would still be being denied the truth, let me know. Go ahead, Ian. Well, here's a good comment that follows on from that, Linda. Virgo Queen is in the chat tonight and says, I was abducted for eight hours in 2007 by a tall white one of the many things he told me was that we came from Mars. The we is human or the we is tall white or? Uh, that's just what it says. One of the many things he told me was that we came from Mars. I assume we being uh, humanity, the people that we are here on this planet now. Could she please sketch for me the tall white as she's describing, because I get sketches, lots of sketches, where people say, this is the, the tall white you're talking about, but that's not the tall white I'm talking about. I have shown in so many of our programs exactly, it's almost like a photograph of a tall white as I understand it. Uh, eight feet, uh, very t long, tall, thin, um, I'll, I'll get it out for next week so we can show it again. This is what a tall white, according to military people, scientists, this is what a tall white looks like. There are thin, six to seven foot tall, large-headed beings that I understand are the progenitor, original, biological grays that are not all AI. I think some people confuse those and they, they don't look anything alike. Uh, but I've heard people say to me, I was in front of a tall, thin gray that was about seven feet tall, had whitish beige skin. Linda, is that a tall white? No, it's not. And so we need to continue to educate ourselves and one of the things that I did in my book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume uh, 1 and 2, is that I put a lot of colored illustrations and a few black and white, but mostly colored, that runs through Glimpses, Volume 1 and Glimpses, Volume 2. In fact, there's a huge uh, taxonomy in Glimpses, Volume 2 and 1 of all of the different drawings that had come to me when I did those books uh, that had been evolving from the 70s through the 80s and the 90s uh, into the, the 2000s, that when you start breaking down, when pe uh, people are not, you're not weighing or waiting what it is that they are seeing or you're, you're not adding to anything. You're just asking for illustrations. That's all I do. And then you can get a hundred illustrations with people with their letters of who they think and what they think that they are dealing with. And it might be completely different from what I'm seeing from sort of a high altitude look down at so many illustrations that the categories when they're divided by physical appearance, they can take on a different category. So uh, for those of you who haven't got Glimpses Volume 1 and 2, I would recommend so that we have a dialogue with each other in which there is a common ground, a common denominator about all of the different types uh, abductions that have to do with soul recycling, uh, animal mutilations that may have something to do with sustenance for various types of other intelligences. There's a lot in those two books. And if we all had those two books shared, it would, I think, it would really be helpful. So 
Uh, on that uh, note, Ian, if you will ask uh, people who are, are having abductions or face-to-face -face or whatever they are, to please do illustrations and send me first. I think that would help a lot. Yes, yeah, so I've reached out to Virgo Queed and hopefully we'll get some uh, some results there. Okay. In, um, here's one from Linda Howe Batson. Uh, she says, in 1977, my four-year-old son walked into the front door and told me he used to live on Mars. He was a soldier and there was a really big war and he was killed, and then he flew into me. I would love to talk with her. Can she, if she's listening now, can you email me at earthfiles at earthfiles.com, uh, your phone number? I never, ever give out contact information. You never have to worry. You can give me whatever contact information you're comfortable with. I never give it out. And I, I would really like to talk with you. Let's uh, hope we get a response there from her as well. Several people are referencing as well the so-called child genius in Russia, Boriska. Yes. Uh, now, he is yeah. now 21 years old, I believe. <clears throat> but he, he claims to have been an alien from Mars that was reincarnated in human form after his species were wiped out in nuclear conflict. And he wants to warn us of the battle. Um, actually, I think he's now probably even older than 24, 20, yeah, he's now probably 29, I think. I have read some about him, but have you or does anybody have any information about whether or not he has put any, like a, like a long narrative of what he knew on Mars, what he has learned on Earth? Has he put it in any kind of really long, in-depth writing? I haven't. Although I don't. aware of that, but perhaps our viewers can help us out with that. Yeah. He does. Yeah, he I, does say that he he was a pilot among the aliens and that he travelled to Earth in 1996 and was then reborn as a human child. And also, what all of this to me is evolving to is the huge, huge subject of our souls. And and the soul. Uh, there was something sent to me recently having to do with nuclear war and about some beings hating humans so much that they want to vaporize our souls, again reinforcing that there are beings and intelligences that know about human souls and that human souls are strong and that it may be that some intelligences have recycling through souls. And it may be that other intelligences do not, that it is some other process. How would all of that fit into which non-humans abduct which humans? For what reasons? And that if we knew the truth, we might be able to make our own souls stronger, not able to be taken. Linda, I've just checked on um, one of the sources. It says, mystery surrounds Boriska's current whereabouts, along with his mother, who have apparently disappeared. Attempts by Western journalists oh. to track him down have all failed. One journalist is said to have been told by a Russian associate that he's now living in a remote village under the protection of the Russian government and any attempt to try to contact him would be futile. Well, that is a remarkable footnote to tonight that I, I hope if there's any of you who actually know more information about him and have, have in your possession anything that has gone in depth of him describing what he has seen and what he knows. I would love to read it because I really take that case seriously. And then now why would he be withdrawn by the whatever Russian hierarchy? Uh, so this is, <laughs> this is adding fuel to the mystery fire as we are getting to the end of 2022 and a lot of people thinking that 2023 will be the transition 
from classified reality to finally starting to get the truth. And how sad and ironic it would be that somebody like that would suddenly be taken uh, and, and excluded from interacting with the world. And the question would be why. Linda Lee Gross has also added to her previous experiences of her life, previous life on Mars. She says, these experiences were induced by two men who appeared in the astral and gave me the experiences because they wanted to know who the people were who destroyed Mars. She also says, by the way, the craft I saw on Mars were round ships, not triangular. And we would like to see some pictures of those, as you said. So yes. if you can contact the pictures, that'll be good. Yeah. Any of you who feel like you've had vivid dreams or flashes of memory, like it comes in to your forehead area, um, and that you feel like you've been on Mars, uh, if you've seen entities, craft, uh, I would welcome seeing illustrations through your mind's eye. And uh, I'm thinking of Lynn Buchanan did a remote viewing and ended up on Mars. And others who were in the government's uh, Project Stargate, that they have done remote viewing on Mars. Uh, one of the CIA, uh, there's a document that I have that was released through the CIA of a remote viewing on Mars. And the thing about it is everything and anything that they actually release, it really isn't very interesting. They've taken out all of the, all of the good stuff. Uh, so if anybody is working in a remote viewing process project and feel like that there would be a reason for us to talk about how we could do a really legitimate and professional remote viewing of Mars today, I would sure be interested because I think that that planet is going to play a big role in the future of what's happening between Earth and this solar system and beyond. But right now, everything seems so murky and we thought that Elon Musk was the one who in 2026 was going to launch on his goal to get, as he said and announced, a million people in bases on Mars by 2050, 2050. And now he's overwhelmed by the Twitter uh, purchase and all of these other things. Is he really going to be concentrating on a whole Mars exodus of humans, I don't know, meaning exodus from Earth to Mars. <laughs> the world is getting stranger and stranger. And I'm glad we have each other on Wednesday nights to be able to talk about what I think are really important subjects if we could just get some facts and truth. So I want to say thank you with a big, big agape love to all of you and May you stay healthy and ask for protection from the thought that dwells in the light. And I'll see you next week. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC, and then select auto translate. Select a language Bind them anywhere. They love and the captions the will now appear in that language. Sort of gone through and they will hold their heads. I never had a cat do that before. And they'll pull against the comb, helping me get out snarls. And I think it's the best they've ever been.